Today is our fourth and final week in the Days of Noah series. We have been on a journey going through Genesis chapter 6 through 9. We have seen grace find Noah, grace keep Noah, God's covenant with Noah coming from his gracious heart. And today we are going to see there is one needed that is greater than Noah. And just a quick review, the flood is over. Sin first filled the world, then God filled the world with water to remove the sin. The flood had wiped the world clean. It was literally the wrath of God poured out against the whole human race. Only Noah and his family that entered the ark survived. Last week, God had the judgment end. The water began to recede, and God led Noah to leave the ark. The future looked bright. There was a beautiful rainbow in the sky sealing God's covenant with his children. And the first thing Noah did just wonderfully, he did not build a house for himself. Instead, he built an altar and he offered a sacrifice to God, learning, teaching us today that one begins well, that begins with God. There was, in a sense, last week, a new world, a new creation with new citizens, a second chance to do what the first Adam did not do in the earlier chapters of Genesis. In fact, Noah looked like the second Adam. That's what we said last week. Everything was really pristine and perfect laboratory conditions to get right what Adam got wrong in the beginning of the Bible. If anyone on their own could have ever met this standard, this was the chance. This was the opportunity before Noah. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever seen the TV show called What Would You Do on ABC before, but it's a very interesting show because it's essentially a type of a role-playing show where they hire actors to play a part in public areas, and they want to see how people would respond if they were in that situation. In fact, some of the titles, I watched a few little snippets of them on the internet to get an idea of how to share this. One was entitled Overweight People Reprimanded by a Waiter where people that were struggling with weight problems were in a restaurant and the waiter publicly reprimanded them on their poor food choices. What would the people around them do? Another one was racism in an upscale store. One was elderly harassed by young people in which young people were saying derogatory and mean-spirited things in a public area to elderly people. And how would those who were coming by respond? Uh, There was one homeless man assaulted. What would people do as this was happening? And then uh, there was one that I watched. It was entitled Abusive Boyfriend. And the scenario is a young man and a young woman on a park bench in a very public area with many people around. And he's harassing her, calling her profane names, elevated voice, pushing her around, being very abusive. It just bothered me watching this for the minute or two that this clip was on. And of course, as she looks there, abused and defeated, People walk right by one after another and they don't do anything about it. And then there was one lady who finally stepped in and intervened in this episode. And this is what she said. I found it interesting. She said, there are a million people around here. You think they would help. And yet they didn't. Kind of interesting. If you watch the show, even the people that do help usually don't do a very good job of helping, if you notice. Uh, They're not very good at their attempt to make a difference. Now, I bring that up because a lot of us today often say, I can't understand when God created this world, why Adam would have sinned like he did. Or in this instance, Noah's got everything right. The situation is pristine. Why in the world would he do that? I would never sin if I was in Noah's shoes and had seen what Noah had went through. Well, what would you do is the question, and the answer is you would do exactly what Adam did. You would do exactly what Noah did. And the reason why is Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. After Noah comes off the ark, this is what God says to Noah. The Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. So the intentions, the thoughts of our heart are corrupted. Even in the best environment, we cannot succeed at pleasing God on our own. Often when we teach 
Noah in Sunday school to children. We teach the story like Noah is the hero of the story. And my friends, we have commended Noah. There's many good things to commend about Noah, but the fact is Noah hasn't even spoken yet in the story. Noah is not the hero. Noah is the sinner saved by the Savior. And when we come to this account today, this is the section that nobody talks about. This is the most unknown part of the story of Noah. No children's teachers, for some reason, are sharing these last few verses, but you don't get a proper understanding of Noah if you don't read these last verses we consider today. If I was going to make a movie about this section, I would entitle it The Fall of Noah because it is a gripping account of the nature of sin, the domineering power of sin. And we are going to see here today, Noah was not the second Adam. In fact, we are going to see clearly today, needed one greater than Noah. So join with me as we read God's word and we'll pray. Genesis chapter 9, begin with me at verse 18. Scripture says, Genesis 9, 18. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk, and he became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine, and he knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah. Blessed be the God of Shem. And may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth. And may he dwell in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be his servant. And notice Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So all the days of Noah were 950 years. And he died. Join me in prayer, please. Lord God, we come to you today, and I pray, Lord, that we would not see Noah as the hero of the story, but instead we would see ourselves in Noah. And instead we would see the one who is greater than Noah, who we need this day, the second Adam, the last Adam, the one who came to do what Adam could not do and what Noah could not do. I pray today that the pervasiveness of our sin would be clearly exposed in our hearts today. God, we confess we have sinned against you this week. Oh Lord, we have sinned positively. We have broken your law. We have sinned negatively. We have not done what you have commanded us to do. We have wandered from you. And I say, Lord, I pray that you would wash our sins away this morning. And it would only be through the work, the power of the blood of Jesus, we would see victory. And we would have hope today. And who you are is our God and what you can do is our Savior and Lord. And we will give praise as you change us this morning. As you provide for our need, our depth of need in our sinful condition. And we will give thanks as you work in Jesus' most excellent name and God's people said, amen. So let's be honest. You haven't heard much about the sons of Noah so far. I mean, they've been mentioned in the genealogies just by passing. God told Noah and his sons to get on the ark. In chapter 9, God blessed Noah and his sons, but they really have been secondary to the whole story, the whole account. They're not the heroes of the story by any means. In fact, we often say it's very possible they helped Noah build the ark, but the Bible never says that they did. That never is spoken of in this text. And yet here, we are told in verse 18, they survived the flood. They made it through the flood. They were on the ark. They obeyed God and they entered the ark just as the earlier chapter said. And it says in verse 19, through them the whole earth was populated. In other words, the whole entire earth, every ethnicity, every people group finds its descent through Noah and his sons. Just like we all find our descent through Adam and his descendants. One man brought the world into existence by the hand of God through The process of giving birth, of childbearing, Adam and Eve starting this. And now Noah becomes the father of the world. And this is kind of cool because scientists just a few years ago released a report saying, and it was very public in the news, that they believed that there was a way to trace genetically 
all men and all women back to one common descendant. And here, very clearly, the Bible's saying all descendants come from them. And I think God wants me to say today to this congregation this morning as an encouragement to you that it was because God blessed them in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. God took something very little and made something great, all the peoples of the world. In other words, some of you need to hear today that God can take what you think is small in your life and he can do something amazingly great if his blessing, if his hand is upon it. Some of you are discouraged this morning. You are down. You feel like you have nothing to offer. And you are right. You are not the hero of the story and you have nothing to offer. But God can take what he has given you and do amazing things with it. And here he repopulates the whole world through these three men, Shem and Ham and Japheth. So let's talk about them for a minute. First, we have the name Shem. You'll notice the name Shem is very similar to the word Semite or Semitic because Shem is the one from whom all the Semitic people will descend. In fact, very important to note for later that Abraham and the Jewish people will see in the Bible descend from this son, Shem, Semite, Semitic. Secondly, we see the son Japheth here. Japheth will be father of one branch of the Gentile world. One very large branch of the Gentiles will come from Japheth. And then the third son is Ham. He's the youngest son of Noah. Shem was the oldest. Ham is the youngest. And he will be the father of different branches of Gentiles, including the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, and kindred groups. But most importantly here, we notice he is the father of Canaan. The people that would come to be known that we read about in the Bible and in history as the Canaanites. These were the people that inhabited the land of Canaan before Israel entered the land. And we know reading the Old Testament that these were people that were very depraved. More on that later. They took part in public cult prostitution. One of the the worst sins ever spoken of in scripture is that of infanticide, child sacrifice. And this is what this people group that descend from Ham were known for. Now, this is not the only son of Ham, the Canaanites, Canaan. Ham had other sons. He is only one of the sons. The other branches, of course, Ethiopia, Egypt, so on and so forth. But the one branch were Canaanites. And remember, as Moses is writing the book of Genesis, recording these words, what an encouragement this must have been to the people of Israel to read that it was the Canaanites that were the ones who would rebel against God one day because they were about to enter the land of Canaan. So that's kind of the context. So now let's look at the story, verse 20. It says, Noah began to be a farmer and he planted a vineyard. Now we don't know what Noah's occupation was before grace found him. But we know after he was called, he had a hundred years to build an ark. He became a mechanic very quickly, right? And he, he did a good job, obviously, by the grace of God, because the ark stood the waters. And yet now he has to go back to being a man of the soil. And I love to read this because it teaches me something. Noah's an older man. He has three younger sons. He is a man who is favored by heaven. He's honored on earth. And yet he will not live an idle life. He will not waste his life by. And he does not think the farmer's calling is beneath him. You see, he is an example for all of us today. Though he's not the perfect example. Let me read to you some Proverbs for a minute. Proverbs 19 verse 15. Slothfulness will cast one into a deep sleep. An idle person will suffer hunger. We don't see that example in Noah at all. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 4. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. You see, a lot of us, we think we hit that golden age of retirement and we can put our feet up and relax. And and I say, yes, there is a truth to that. And that occupational work, it shouldn't necessarily be what we do all of our lives and live for. And yet I say to you today, especially some of you who have hit that age of retirement and you're post that day, praise the Lord, right? That you still have great importance and there is no job beneath what you could do to serve God. And As much work as you put into serving God is what you will get out of it spiritually. If you want to grow as a Christian, no matter what your age, you need to be diligent. 2 Timothy 2 says, study or be diligent to show yourself approved unto God a worker. 1 Corinthians 15 says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. In fact, the prophet Isaiah warned the elderly of Israel. This is what he said to them in Isaiah 56 verse 10. He said, God's watchmen are blind. 
They are without knowledge. They are like silent dogs. They cannot bark. All they do is they dream, they lie down, and they love to slumber. A dog that doesn't bark is essentially what? Let's be honest. Kind of a worthless dog, right? Especially if they're chihuahuas, right? Sorry. Just wanted, to, just wanted to rub it in again from a few weeks ago. God is saying here, listen, you, you have a gift. You have a calling. He has put talents into you. Use them. Noah doesn't see this beneath him. This is a good example. God gave us six days to work and a seventh day to rest. And that is a wonderful principle. And we see here that one of the first crops he plants is a vineyard. In fact, you see the vineyard mentioned throughout the Bible. In Israel, this is one of the staple agricultural products. And he plants a garden. And he plants a vineyard. In fact, the first planter in the Bible was God. Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden, right? So he's just following God in this. And there's there's very honorable job. We often uh, have messed up. And we have such a confused culture today. We think these are the honorable jobs and these are not the honorable jobs. No, Scripture says whatever you do, you can do it heartily as unto the Lord and not men, right? And every one of these is very important to God. But there is a problem in verse 21. It's the problem that many have. It says... He drank of the wine, and he became drunk. He was drunk. And then he became uncovered in his tent. Now, this is the first use of the word wine in the Bible. But it's not the first occasion of drinking. In fact, Jesus talked about the days of Noah in Matthew chapter 24. And he said, as the days of Noah were, men were eating and drinking. In other words, business is normal. And in fact, I think the implication of Jesus' words is they were eating and drinking immoderately. Now, the church has often suffered from overemphasizing the devils that can come with alcohol and alcoholism. And of course, Jesus says, yes, they were immoderately drinking, but they were also immoderately eating. So just remember that, you Baptist Jew out there in the crowd. Both are serious to God when you're immoderate and misusing and abusing what God has given. Now, the question is, why does Noah do this? Well, there is a thought that before the flood, the ecological system was different. Fermentation may have started to happen faster due to the conditions as a result of the flood. That very well could be the case. But it seems to me that Noah knowingly did this. He was sinning when he did this. He could have done this, yes, through inexperience or ignorance, not understanding the strength and the nature of alcohol, of liquor. Or I think he could have done this probably more likely because of an infirmity of the flesh, because of a sinful nature that Noah still has, Genesis 8.21. In fact, you can think about this. Put yourself in Noah's shoes. He begins to reflect on what has happened the last year. Everyone he knew has died. The world has been destroyed, broken by the judgment of God. It is a desolate world. And now he is alone with his sons, who evidently at least one of them is not a very shining figure. And all of a sudden, he becomes depressed and overwhelmed. It would be very easy to try to abuse one of God's gifts, that is wine, by getting drunk, to try to forget the pain and the sadness and the brokenness that was around you. In fact, Scripture warns of this many times. Proverbs chapter 20 and chapter 23 say these words, Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is not wise. You notice it's not the use of wine, it's being led astray by it. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? The writer of Proverbs says. Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look on wine when it is red and sparkles in the cup and swirls around smoothly. Because at the last it bites like a serpent and it stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. In other words, you will lose control when you get drunk. You will lose control of yourself. Now, there's always been a discussion in the church. And there's always been overemphasis of sin on one way or the other. We either de-emphasize sin or we overemphasize the power of sin and alcoholism. And my friends, I think we need to have a biblical position. We need to understand what Scripture says about it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, this is what Paul says. Hear these words. Very important. Don't miss this. Write this down for later. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. First question. Is it helpful to me or hurtful to me? Secondly, all things are lawful for me. He's quoted in the Old Testament. But I will not be dominated. Literally, I will not be under the power of anything. 
In other words, can you have a cup of wine and not have your mind altered? Yes. But you can not be drunk and not have your conscience, your responsibility, your accountability, every level of thinking and function diminished. You know, we see in the world today another discussion that is heating up. It's over the discussion of marijuana. Uh, very same arguments are going to be used. God made the herb, so it must be good for you. No, it's destructive to society, some will say. And the question I ask you today is, can it dominate or put you under the power of it? If it does, it is wrong. Now, the difference between having a cup of wine, of course, and smoking marijuana is it will put you under the power, under the control of it. You will lose conscience. You will lose responsibility. Your function of thinking will be diminished. You will yield up your control to an external purpose, right? It has no other purpose but that. Now, does the scripture ever condemn drinking wine? No. Does it condemn intoxication every single time, right? Does it say, be not drunk with wine? Clearly, do not do this, Ephesians 5.18. Same thing with marijuana or anything else that controls your mind and yields up the control of it from God to the wrong things. It is sin. The Bible is clear. When you think about the United States of America, I looked up the most recent statistics today from the Center for Disease Control, just to make sure. In the U.S., 88,000 people died last year in alcohol-related deaths because of drunkenness, because of intoxication. In fact, according to the CDC, 2.5 million years of potential lives were lost just last year due to the abuse of alcohol. We live in this nation in which the average television viewer will see 90,000 incidents of drinking on television by age 21 and 100,000 beer commercials by age 18. And I say to you, as the old Puritan said, be killing sin or sin will kill you. If you are prone to fall, don't play with fire, correct? Be wise in this. Know your weaknesses. And never under any circumstances does the Bible allow intoxication. So what do we learn from this? What do we learn from Noah taking the swine and misusing it? We know this, number one, that the best of men are not exempted from sin. They are not secure from falling. No one is beyond or above temptation. Now I want you to remember this for a minute. In Genesis chapter 6, we are told after grace found Noah that Noah was a man who was righteous, blameless in his generation, and he walked with God. Yet it was a couple drinks too many that brought the fall of Noah in this passage. In other words, in the past, Noah had been a rare example of righteousness and temperance. He had been an example that we commended in following hard after God. And yet the abuse of alcohol one night caused him to be prostrate and a laughing stock to all. In other words, in 2 Peter 2.5, we are told that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And yet here we find him a preacher of unrighteousness. So we learn from this, if Noah can sin, anyone can sin, right? I warned you today what Matthew Henry has said. Noah, who had kept sober in drunken company, is now drunk in sober company. Let him that thinks he stands take heed. Why? Lest he fall. Lest he fall. Secondly, I think we learn from this that Noah was a righteous man, yes, But he was not so by the righteousness of his works. Instead, he was righteous by the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith. There are so many of you in here, and you continue to play this religious game, and you try hard to do good. I had to sadly listen through, I would use the word miserably, endure through a sermon where I listened to a preacher the whole time talk about do good and be better, and evil will run away from you. All I have to do is do good and do better. My friends, you can't do good or do better what Jesus has already done. In other words, you need to realize that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It was grace that found Noah. It wasn't Noah that found grace. It was the goodness of God that pursued Noah. Noah was one of the ones in Genesis 6, 5, who the thought, every thought and intention of his heart was only evil continually. And like you and me, Noah could blow it. He does here. He's a man. You and I can blow it. But that doesn't make you out of the reach of God. That puts you in the reach of God. Because Jesus didn't come to fix perfect people. He came to fix broken people. Amen? I came to fix sinners, Jesus said. Not the ones who think they're righteous. It was not Noah's works. 
It was the righteousness by faith that saved Noah. Grace is not merely that we are undeserving. We are deserving of his wrath. Don't ever pray, God, give me what I deserve. That's the dumbest prayer you can pray, right? Ask for his grace and his mercy. God shows his love for us, not while we've got it all together, but while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Number three, this is a warning to those of us who have lived long to seek to finish well. How wonderful it would have been if Genesis chapter 9 ended at verse 17 and we didn't get 18 to 29. But God wanted the clear picture of exactly who Noah was and exactly who we are so we would be warned. You see, many in the Bible were strong in living for God when they were young, but they departed from the will of God when they were older. They thought themselves so strong, they stopped putting the confidence in Christ and they put the confidence in themselves. I mean, think about Moses. Moses started well. And yet he sinned late in his life pridefully by striking the rock and taking some of God's glory and anger. David was righteous as a young man. The stories of David and Goliath and his following after God, a man after God's heart, are so profound and wonderful. And yet when David is in his 50s, he sins with Bathsheba. You think of Solomon, who starts out, "Ah, the perfect prayer, God, I want the gift of discernment and knowledge of good and evil and right and wrong and wisdom. And yet, when he is old, he walks out of God's will and he says, I have wasted my life in empty living. You see, none of us is ever past the desires of temptation, the weakness of the flesh, and none of us are ever outside of the need of God's sustaining grace. You think about Peter. He was so puffed up after walking with Jesus three years. He said, others may forsake you, but not I, Lord. And yet he fell hard on his face, did he not? We need the sustaining grace of God. To those of you who are older in this congregation, you need it. And you can still be used just as much as some of the younger people in this congregation. I believe the church is for all peoples of all ages. Amen. And we need you senior saints just as much as we need the young people in the church. Amen. We need you, but we don't need you just sitting here. We need you doing this, following the grace, loving grace, loving mercy, taking the younger people under your wing and demonstrating to them, yes, I am a messed up sinner, but I can tell you the faithfulness of a much better Savior and helping them in their journey. Psalm 71.9 says, Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. Isaiah 46, God says there, He says, Isaiah speaking, Lord, from birth, you carried me in the womb. Even to your old age, God says, I am he. To your gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made you and I will bury you. I will carry and will save you. In other words, stop trying to get ahead of God. Let God carry you in this journey. Let him be the one who upholds you. So Noah, because of his drunkenness, because of his rashness, he becomes uncovered. I don't know if the the wine made him warm and uncover himself, or he may have just simply acted out of his mind. But either way, he's a laughingstock to his family. He ends up drunk and naked in the tent, which is obviously a problem. Verses 22 and 23 say, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and he told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, and they laid it on both of their shoulders, and they went backward, and they covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away. They did not see their father's nakedness. Now, we got to be very clear here on the onset, that for Ham to have accidentally and involuntarily walked in through surprise, unaware, and seen his father's nakedness would not have been a sin. There is an implication here that he gazed with satisfaction. In fact, there's a verse on this very thing about people who take advantage of others, especially because of alcoholic intoxication. Habakkuk 2.15 says, woe to him. Now, we don't think about the word woe much, but basically this is the judgment of God. The curse, not the blessings of God, the cursing of God. Woe to him who makes his neighbor drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk. Why? In order to gaze at their nakedness, to take advantage of them, to shame them. So, what happens here that makes this a sin? There's been some different theories that have been come up with, which the Bible does not say. And then we'll talk about what I think the Bible does teach here. Number one, some people think that Ham seeing his father's nakedness is a euphemism for some gross 
violation that happened. In fact, rabbis have said things like he castrated his father, he abused his father at this moment. But the problem with this view is, number one, the Bible doesn't say it. Number two, the remedy for Ham's deed is simply the covering of Noah's nakedness with a garment. And so I think that's taking it way too far. Some people think, number two, he went into his father's tent where he should not have entered. And he looked with pleasure and delight on his father's nakedness. The implication is he looked with sinful thought and he went to humiliate and dishonor his father to his brothers. I think there's a lot more truth in this idea. In other words, this was an attack on his father's honor. He took pleasure in seeing his father hurt. In fact, John Calvin has written here, they who deface the image of their heavenly father in themselves will become a laughing stock to their own children. When Noah fell and he got drunk, he defaced the image of God. And so he was a laughing stock to his children. What a warning this is here. We know this by nature. We see that next to God, the next most deeply person that should be reverenced is our parents. Nature itself teaches us this. And in fact, Matthew Henry has said, Ham is here called the father of Canaan, which tells us that he who was himself a father should have been more respectful to him that was his father. And by the way, doesn't the Bible say something about this? Like Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the earth. I'm pretty sure it does. Number three, I think there's a third thing here that I think is very much true, and that is that Ham was glad to see his father's dignity and his father's authority reduced to such weakness. weakness. He was glad to see his father fall because he was not just dishonoring him as a parent, but as a preacher of righteousness. You see, his heart was hard. He might have been in the ark, but he did not believe and receive the gospel his father believed. In fact, I think it's very amazing when you think about this idea because according to 1 Peter 3.20, when they got off that ark, there was only eight people alive. Some time has passed till verse 18 to 29. And so during that time, they probably had sons, grandsons. Uh, there was more people living on the earth at this time. And yet even with such a small number of people, we find one who is inwardly sinful. One who is inwardly rejecting the righteousness of God that is given to him. In fact, this should teach us today that we should never be surprised when you get a group of people together. If there are not wheat and tares in the field, right? In fact, Jesus himself said this in Matthew 13. He said, at the time of harvest, both will be growing together. And at the end of the harvest, he says, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. In other words, that there will always be a mixture of the true and false in the church. It's not our job to separate them. That's God's job. Our job is help the tares to become wheat. Amen? That's what we should be concerned about. So, he goes, he tells his brothers what he saw, publishes the news with delight, if you will, dishonoring his father and his father's message. You know, let me warn you today, the only thing worse and this is so important here in our culture today because a lot of people say, I wouldn't do that, but I have no problem with them doing it. Who's heard that one before, right? I personally, it's not the way I live, but there's nothing wrong with them doing it. I celebrate that. I stand with them in doing that. Well, the only thing worse than committing the specific sin, Ham didn't get drunk. The only thing worse than committing the specific, specific sin is the delight, the devilish delight of finding it and reveling in that sin in others. In fact, Romans 1 says these words. They not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. They enjoy the fact that others have fallen. They celebrate this. Instead of weeping for them and seeking to help them, they rejoice with them in their fall. How sad this is indeed. But you notice the right example of Shem and Japheth in verse 23. Ham came sharing this, hoping his, father's, his brothers would scoff with him and laugh at their father with him. But Shem and Japheth, by contrast, show respect to their father. By the way, you don't always have to agree with your parents, but you're called to show respect to them, right? And that's what we see here. They don't agree with Noah's drunkenness, but they respect him as their father. And so, without even glancing at Noah's naked body, they take every pain, great pains, to honor their father in his falling state. And we are told twice, they approach him backwards with the blanket to cover him. You know, I'm reminded of what 
Peter tells us, there is to be a blanket of love to be thrown over all the faults of others. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, keep love among one another earnestly because love will cover a multitude of sins. I want you to notice this is how we should respond to sin in the church. They do not only not want to see it for themselves because they honor their father, but they make sure no one else sees it. They are an example how to deal with sin. They don't go talk about it to everybody else, right? They go directly to their father. They deal with it right there. They don't say, let me think on that for a month and then I'll come back and tell about six people before I go to the individual, right? They go right to their father in concern and care and compassion and they deal with it there. This is how we are supposed to deal with sin as well. Look at verse 24. So Noah awoke from his wine. He becomes awake. I think there's more to that than just literally waking up. It means the strength of the wine, the alcohol was gone from his system. He came to himself. He was sober. He knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. Now again, in chapter 9, God spoke a benediction, a blessing over the sons of Noah and Noah himself. Here we have a malediction. A curse that is spoken, as well as a blessing on the other two sons. Noah here is not in a drunken fit like some profane person just cursing his son for what he has done. There is a spirit of prophecy, a spirit of God that comes upon him. And like the dying Jacob in Genesis chapter 49, he begins to pray over his sons what will befall them one day. God begins to speak through him again. I love this. Even though Noah has fallen, it is the goodness of God that restores him. And again, he is being used by God and he is about to prophesy. You see, the man who had been drunk with wine is now filled with the spirit. Amen. Some of you have been drunk with wine. Some of you have fallen hard like Noah. But I want to encourage you today. The grace of God is greater than your sin and he can restore you. He can use you again. That is the message of the gospel. God is not done writing the story. Amen. He is not done. I like what James Boyce has written here. According to some people's theology, Noah would have lost his salvation when he became drunk and laid uncovered in his tent. But Noah had been sealed into the eternal covenant of God. And although he was uncovered physically, he was nevertheless covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's what keeps Noah here. So Noah begins to speak by the the word of God. And he says these words that have been really twisted often but are most important. He says, cursed be Canaan. Now, we haven't read about Canaan yet. In fact, we don't read about him until the next chapter. We find out he's one of the sons of Ham. He doesn't curse the other sons. He curses Canaan. Well, the question is asked, was Canaan involved in the sin against Noah in some way? The Bible doesn't say that. So I won't give you all the ideas that theologians have of how Canaan was involved. It doesn't say that he was involved. But it does say that he would be cursed. So what do we know about this? Number one, we know that Ham is punished for his dishonor to his father by having a son who would bring dishonor to him. Notice the curse is not on the Hamites. It's not on all the descendants of Ham. It is only a curse on the Canaanites who would one day be the inhabitants of what the modern world calls Palestine. We know today as Israel. You see, these were the ones who loved cult prostitution, who committed immorality openly, who took part in the worst, the most grievous of sins to God's heart, the sin of infanticide. They would take their own children newborn and literally dash them upon rocks to kill them as a means of sacrifice to their false idols. It was one of the most damning of things that hurt the heart of God severely. And these were the ones who would be doing this in the future. And he says here, they would be the ones who Joshua and later Solomon would have to battle against and remove from the land. And he says here, not cursed be all the descendants of Ham, but cursed be Canaan. As Ham dishonored his father, he would have a son who would bring dishonor to him. Secondly, often people say this is a horrible thing of God. This is so overly judgmental of God. But my friends, we should look at it as the mercy of God. Because the fact is, by sin, we all deserve to be cursed. We all are are under the curse of God, right? Our sin has brought us under his curse. Jesus came to break the curse. And this is the mercy of God. Because he could have cursed all of Ham's descendants. But instead, he only cursed one-fourth part, the Canaanites. Only one 
of the four sons of Ham. The other children of Ham are not mentioned at all. And by the way, the Canaanites have become long ago extinct, meaning this curse cannot be applied to anyone else today. Now, I remember when I came to Pensacola, it was still being taught in some of our churches, and even people that attended Southern Baptist churches told me that they believed that this was a curse that was enforced today. Of course, they called it the curse of Ham. Ham's not mentioned. And you notice what the curse says. He will be a servant of servants. So by birth, they were equals. Now they're going to be servants. Conquered people in the Old Testament era were called servants. So when Babylon conquers Israel, not everyone's a physical servant of Nebuchadnezzar, but they're all in servitude to Babylon. They're not necessarily household or private slaves, but they are in servitude in that positional sense. So it says here, Shem, the ancestor of Israel, and the other Semites would be masters of the descendants of Canaan, the Canaanites. Now, when I came here some years ago, I heard this being taught and it blew my mind. And yet preachers were teaching this stuff. They were teaching that the curse was a curse on Ham and it was a proof text for slavery and racism and segregation. And and I almost had a slight heart attack when I found this out, that people were teaching this. They weren't reading their Bibles. They were listening to really ignorant preachers, right? And they were told, and this passage was wrongly appealed to in past centuries, to justify the enslavement, in particular in America, of African descent people. And they would justify the grievous abuses, the injustice, and the inhumanity to people made in the image of God based on this verse right here. And since I only get this opportunity once, maybe in every 10 years to be here, I want to talk about it for a minute. Does the Bible acknowledge slavery as a reality? Yes, it does. It talks about slavery. In fact, most people don't know the Bible gives three rules about slavery. And not a single one of them was followed in England or America when it came to the slave trade. Number one, Numbers 31.30, only prisoners of lawful wars were allowed to be taken as slaves. If there was a lawful war... You could take a slave from the war. Numbers 31.30. That did not happen in American slavery. Number two. According to Exodus 21 verses 2 through 3. Anyone who stole a man was condemned to death in the Torah. In the Old Testament. That's called human trafficking. If you took someone else, stole them, you would be condemned to death. In other words, God wanted your life for trying to steal their life. That was not followed, obviously. That's how the slave train came into existence, stealing men. Number three, the third rule. A Hebrew slave was to be released after six years of slavery. Exodus 21, 2 through 3. They could only be kept as a slave for six years. And then they were to begin in their freedom after being taken in war. That was not followed. In fact, I can give you a fourth one. The New Testament says in Galatians 3.28, there is now no distinction in Christ between Jew or Gentile, slave or free. We are one in Christ Jesus. God has broken down those laws and rules. He has broken down that order. And anyway, let's get back to the Bible here for a minute. There was no curse on Ham. It was a curse on the Canaanites and the Canaanites only. Amen? So Let's just affirm it again today, as we affirm all the time here, every single form of racism is a grievous sin against the image of God. Amen? We are made of one blood, of one descent, Adam, Noah, his sons. And before God, the blood of Jesus redeems us all. Let's end this. 26 to 29. We're just about done. Noah said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. I started out talking about what would you do, the TV show. What would you do if you had pristine conditions? Very clearly, Noah was not the second Adam. Even under perfect conditions, he could not love God with all of his heart. He could not keep himself from sinning. His fall was hard. But in God's mercy, there is one coming who is greater than Noah. Verse 26, there was a curse on Canaan, but praise the Lord, there was a blessing on Shem. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. In other words, he gives all the glory to God for what God is going to do through the line of Shem. 
Instead of just blessing and praising Shem, who was God's instrument to cover his father, he's saying the blessing goes to God who will work through Shem. Yahweh will be Shem's God. He will be Shem's blessing. The blessing of Shem is that the one true God, Yahweh, is his God and will be his God forever. So let's think about this as we wrap this up. Genesis 3.15, Adam sins. God says, I'm going to put warfare between the seed of Adam, the descendants of Adam, and the serpent, Satan. The serpent will bite the heel of the descendant of Adam. Genesis 3.15. But the seed of Adam, he will crush the head of the serpent. We are told that there's someone coming who's going to be a descendant of Adam and Eve who is going to deal with sin once and for all and bring the blessing of God on the world. In Genesis chapter 4, Eve thought that was Cain. She was wrong. She said, I've gotten a man child and another Adam, Adam in Hebrew, from the Lord. It wasn't Cain. Then we see later in Genesis, there's the godly line of Seth and the ungodly line of Cain that are spread in the world before the flood. Well, guess who comes from the godly line of Seth? His name is Noah and his sons. Number three, we see here, the blessing of God will come on the people that come through Shem. The descendants of Shem will be blessed of God. The blessing will come through them. And then we get to Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 17. And God is very clear. The blessing will come through a man named Abraham, right? Well, guess what line Abraham's from? The line of Shem. And then in Genesis 49, Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, and then Jacob has Judah, right? And we find out in Genesis 49, the tribe of Judah will bring shalom, will bring peace. They will rule this world one day. And then we get to 2 Samuel chapter 7. David's seed will rule. It is through the line of David, through the line of Judah, through the line of Abraham, through the line of Shem, through the line of Adam, that there will be a blessing through the whole world. And then we get to the New Testament and we read the genealogies of Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3. And we find out that the blessing that Abraham was told, I will bless those that bless you, and through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. It did come from Shem, and it came through his descendant, and his name is Jesus Christ, the greater one. We needed one greater than Noah, and God provided him in Jesus. J.C. Ryle has said, the second Adam is far greater than the first Adam ever was. The first Adam was only a man, and he fell. The second Adam was God as well as man, and he completely conquered our sins. He gets all the glory because he did all the work. And so, may God, verse 27, look at God's graciousness. It's not just going to be the Jewish people, though. Yes, God loves the Jewish people, but it's not just them. The blessing continues. This is the same thing that was told to Abraham. May God enlarge Japheth. And may he as well dwell in the tents of Shem. By the way, the Gentiles are the descendants of Japheth, right? The spiritual blessings that come through Shem, guess who's going to be engrafted? You remember that word in the New Testament? Guess who's going to be brought into this family? The Gentiles. And it is better to dwell with God in tents than to live in palaces without him. We will be a people wandering on this earth because this world is not our home. We are just passing through. Amen. One day the Messiah will come and he will bring the Gentiles and his family. And if you're not of Jewish blood today, thank God that it was not Noah that was the greater one. It was one greater than Noah that would come. And the blessing would even come to the people of Japheth. And that's why we see heaven in Revelation chapter 5. And the people around the throne singing say, Jesus, you are worthy because you have ransomed by your blood a people for God from every tribe and tongue and people and nation forever. Place to his name. I love how this ends. We get the report of Noah's death. Noah was one of the oldest men to ever live. The oldest patriarch on record except Methuselah and Jared. Yet his age wasn't good enough. His works were not good enough. It took the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the ancient of days, to bring salvation and remove sin once and for all. So if you look at the ark today, as we close the series, The Days of Noah, you look at the ark and you see the wrath of God. 
You see the judgment of God for sin. God says, I have to deal with sin. My spirit will not strive with man forever. And he floods the earth and he brings judgment. But you look to the ark and you see the salvation of God. I will save a people through Noah, through Shem, that will be a blessing to all the world. You see the judgment of God at the ark. But you see the blessing of God to those who enter. And my friends, if you look to the cross today, you will see the wrath of God. You will see the judgment of God. God pouring out his wrath over sin. But you will also see the love of God in Jesus Christ, our righteousness. You will see that God so loved the world. He gave his one and only unique son to take our wrath, to take our judgment and love so that whoever believes in him will not perish in the flood waters. You will have everlasting life. My friends, we are great sinners. We are sinners like Noah. Some of us are worse sinners than Noah. But bottom line, Jesus is a greater Savior. He's the one we need. He's the hero of this story. It's his righteousness that covers us with that that garment that keeps us from having our nakedness exposed. He is the ark of salvation. And today, no matter how great your sin is and how great your fall has been, he is greater. And if you run to him and you seek refuge in him, you will be saved. Even next week, we're going to have baptisms. If you trust in Jesus today, you can be baptized next Sunday and let the world know that God has changed you and forgiven you forever. And one day you will rise with him and his goodness and love. Join me in prayer. We'll bow before our Lord together. Oh God, we are sinners. And we confess this today. We look at the ark and we see your judgment, but we also see your love. And Lord, I pray for any here who are under judgment, who are outside the ark. Any here who are like Noah, they have fallen and they are naked before you. And they need the covering of the righteousness of Jesus. They need the blessing of God through Shem. And through Shem's descendant, the Messiah, the Savior Christ. Oh Lord, I pray right now that you would do a work that I cannot do in their hearts. That they would call out to you. We believe, Lord, that whoever calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. If you don't know Christ, you call out to him right now. The one greater than Noah. God, save them. Change them. Friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist, and I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.